Welcome to the radio program, The Uncreated Light Blog. I'm your host, Drake Shelton, on this July 19th, 2013. This broadcast is for the spiritual and temporal benefit of my people, the atheist-driven and socially suicidal minority, Caucasian peoples, primarily the peoples of the Southland of America, but also of the world, the white race, known in biblical chronology as the Lion of Japheth. This broadcast is intended to call my peoples back to their covenant obligations and the solemn league and covenant, pursuant to the royal prerogative of Yahshua HaMashiach, who having resurrected from the dead, sent it far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, for he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. In doing so, this broadcast will expose the unforgivable treason committed against Yahshua's royal prerogative by the so-called Enlightenment and its offspring, Dispensationalism, Arminianism, Liberty of Conscience, Materialism, Darwinism, and their social applications, Pluralism, Integration, Miscegenation, and the Communist idea of rights developed out of abolition philosophy in the mid to late 19th century. I'm supposed to be having Eric Phelps on uh, with me today. I'm waiting. To, there he is, right there. Hey, here I am, Drake. Sorry, I'm late. Hey, Eric, you with me? All right, very. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you um, you made it. I, I was listening to your program right when you were uh, ending right there, and I was um, I was hoping you were going to get in pretty clean, and and you did. So I'm grateful you're here with me. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you too, Drake. Um, I tell you, I tell you, I have um, I've been I I have I follow a number of guys. Um, uh, that are part of a um, kind of a white nationalist movement in the South, and uh, constantly on my Facebook page, I'm I'm seeing stuff about <laughs> Jews. Just everything <laughs> is about Jews. That's that's the big problem they think. And yeah. uh, you, you have, have you ever heard of this guy, Brother Nathaniel? Oh yeah, you've heard He's of Orthodox. Him. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the Russian Orthodox. Uh, I'm to, I'm totally convinced, brother, that he's a Jesuit coadjutor, completely. <laughs> Why do you think that? Is, is there a... Did, well, well, the Jes- to... Yeah, the Jesuits have penetrated the Orthodox Church completely. Oh, In yeah. In fact, their their patriarch is Jesuit trained. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, Ware, right? Timothy Ware? Is, uh, he's, he, is he Russian? He's not the Russian. He's the... Uh, he's part of the uh, <laughs> Greek, right? I think it was Krill. I think his name was Krill. I have it in my notes here. Krill? But okay. This, this, this patriarch was trained by Jesuits. So, and I have a book here on the Jesuits. They, they learned the old the Eastern Rite, you know, so they can penetrate oh, the yeah. Orthodox Church. And today, you know, the Orthodox Church, the only difference between the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church is between Tweedly Dee and Tweedly Dumb. Yeah. Uh, it's, they're just it's terrible, oppressing the people. I have a lady friend who was a missionary there, and she told me the Orthodox Church would in... Uh, Romania told told the people that they would have to give their entire uh, uh, wages for the year to get him to do some prayers or whatever it was. Oh wow! Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, and I and I have a missionary friend there, Pete Heisey. He's to Romania. He told me that the leading Orthodox priest in the town there, where he's at, he's the head of the occult, and he puts oh, spells wow. on people, and and they pay the people go to the Orthodox priest to put spells on other people. <laughs> It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, incredible. I want to, uh, I want to, it, it, my listeners, I want to uh, give you a context of this guy, Brother Nathaniel. I got a clip here from one of his videos, and this is going to be foundational to the conversation that Eric and I are about to have. Uh, this is a, this is a YouTube. He has a very popular YouTube clip. I see this smathered all over my Facebook all the time, and I've had a pretty heated conversations with some friends of mine on Facebook about this guy. So I just want you to listen to a video here that he has put out on Facebook just a few weeks ago. Here it goes. Europe is the church, and the church is Europe, wrote Hilaire Belloc, the 20th century English historian. But with the dismantling of the church accomplished by the regicides of Charles I, Louis XVI, and Tsar Nicholas II, church and state no longer act as a foil against the intrigues of international Jewry. Today, Europe, once known and experienced as Christendom, wherein Jews were considered enemies of the gospel, is a secular wasteland. 
It's ruled instead by the synagogue, with Jews at the highest levels of economic, political, and cultural influence. Okay, so that that's that's the the, the substance of it. Okay, he's he's okay. wanting he's wanting everybody to believe that the downfall of the monarchical uh, powers in Europe is is behind and, and the people behind that are the Jews and uh the Protestant what, what you get when you start talking to these people you start digging into their thought process is that behind the rise of the Jews is the Protestant Reformation yeah they think, yeah yeah <laughs> they the, the Protestant Reformation is is what is the platform upon which the Jews have risen to power in the West. They they killed off and supposedly the, you know the communist regimes that rise up in France and other areas in Russia. Somehow that's connected to the Protestant Reformation. How they pull that piece of gymnastics off is is beyond me. But uh, it's all all this the communist movements and the revolutions, the American Revolution. It's all connected. It's a Jewish conspiracy to for Jews to gain power. Okay, that that's what this is about. Okay, that's what these guys think. All right, so I, I we, we we just need we just need to start at the beginning of European history. Eric, can you tell us who were the first international bankers in Europe? Can we talk about this? The first, yes, we did. The first international bankers in Europe were the Knights Templars. Are they Jews? They ran everything. <laughs> were those no, Jews? White, they're yeah. white Gentiles, Frenchmen particularly. Yep. I, uh, well, you have, the suppre- you have the suppression of the Templars in, uh, what, 1312 by the Pope, Clement V, mm-hmm. and uh, encouraged by Philip the Fair, who was the king of France, and that's why they burned Jacques de Molay at the stake, because he was the head of the Templars. So yeah. the Templars were absolutely white Gentiles, running the banking of Europe, and not only Europe, because you see the Templars were, were having a trade around the world. They were the yeah. big shippers. Mm-hmm. So, no, they were the first, but there were some Jews that were also t- uh, uh, bankers at the time, but they were subordinate to the Templars, and they were called the Fuggers. The Fuggers, okay. and you can read about them in Ridpatch Universal History. Okay. So the, Je- so the Jesuits have done the same thing, because remember, the Jesuits are the new Knights Templars, so they have then sought to use certain Jews as front men to make it look like the Jews run everything, when the fact of the matter is the ten Roman families are the gigatrillionaires, the big bankers. In fact, the, the head of the European bank there in Europe, his name was Draghi. He's an Italian knight of Malta. But nobody mm-hmm. talks yeah. about him. Yeah. And folks uh, folks listening, uh, Eric has made a series of videos. I think one guy put it together in one video. It's called The Jesuit Banking System on YouTube. It's very good. I, I listened to the whole thing a couple times through. I, I'd like to document all that and just put it on one page on my website just to just to show everyone that the heads of the big banking cartels, not only in our country, the Bank of America and all the big banking uh, organizations here in America, not only here but also with the European Union – are white men that are associated or connected somehow with the Knights of Malta or some other Masonic organization. And um, that brings us to another issue with the Templars. It, it, is, it is something beh- – th- these men here in America, these white men who think the Jews are behind everything and the Jews are controlling everything, they, they correctly see some problems with the Zionist obsession – with uh, the United States military, some forms of dispensational Baptist theology, and um, we, we are led to believe that Jews are the only ones that are concerned about Zionism, but that's not true. Uh, as you pointed out in your work, Eric, the Templars and their Latin kingdom of Jerusalem is really the, the kind of the golden age of Zionism. Of course. Yeah, yeah, because remember, the Templars, the nice Templars, and, uh, well, the Equestrians were there, too. And that's pretty well shown in the book, in the book, uh, Kingdom of, or in the movies, Kingdom of Heaven, that two-part yeah. set. But um, the, the nice Templars were busy running the kingdom, the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, mm-hmm. as a sort of universal world headquarters for themselves. 
Mm-hmm. And when the when I believe the Lord used the Muslims to end that, because he raised up the Mamluks out of Egypt to drive out the Knights Templars in uh, 1291. Mm-hmm. So that's the formal end of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. And they were driven to uh, roads. They were driven to surrounding islands. And then ultimately it went to Malta. Hold just a second. I don't lose the phone here. Hold it. What happened was is um, the Mamluks drove them out. So it's, and the, then the Knights Templars ultimately went and became the Scottish Knights Templars, and then that's where you have Scottish Rite Freemason revived by the Jesuits. But okay. the Jesuits then wouldn't use Napoleon to punish the Mamluks in the Battle of Egypt there in, in Cairo, and he would kill the entire Mamluk bodyguard of the Sultan as vengeance for what the Mamluks did when they drove out the Templars in 1291. Huh. That's, that's the only way we can understand the po- that's the only way we can understand Napoleon's invasion of of uh, Egypt. Otherwise, it makes complete and total no no sense at all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We it looks like I've got another caller here. Um, I'm gonna see if they have a question. Hold on one second here. Cool. Hello, hello, caller. Who's this? Uh, Jason from Texas. I'm just listening. Oh, you're just listening. Okay. Did you have a question for Eric or for myself? Or? Um, not yet. I'll come back to him. Okay. I'll, I'll hit one. I'll just you and get back to you later. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, Eric. I saw another caller there. I thought he might have a question. All right. Uh, so here's um, so here's just another issue, and I, I hear them talking about this stuff pretty frequently. Um, the Alambrado, Al- Alambrados. I'm probably not pronouncing that properly. Who are these right. guys, Alambrados. Alambrados? The Alambrados were a Spanish secret society at the time of Ignatius Loyola. Uh-huh. And uh, Loyola was a member of it, because remember, Loyola was also, and this is hard to find, but my former pastor found it for me, Loyola was a uh, Spanish Templar. Okay. And so he was a Spanish Templar, he was an Alambrados, which is involved in the the enlightened ones, the Illuminati, as you would, he would, the Jesuits would later found that in 1776, right. and so, um, and so he would begin to build this super secret society, which he first named the Knights of the Virgin Mary, and then he later changes to the Society of Jesus, as a new Knights Templar for the purpose, twofold purpose of taking Jerusalem from the Saracens, and for destroying the Reformation in Europe and restoring the Pope's temporal power or his political rule of all governments over the world. That was the purpose and is the purpose of the Jesuits. Yeah. And I remember when I was a Presbyterian seminary student, um, uh, Wiley's History of Protestantism was uh, a standard issue. And uh, in that work, he talks about how their their, uh, agenda is to get all of the gold and the silver of Christendom. Uh, He makes that very clear. Very clear. And that's, for your listeners, it's Volume 2, Book 15. And it's about okay. 50 pages. And I copied every one of those pages, and I put them in my, at the end of my uh, Vatican Investment CDs. So I've got them all there. Well, well, good. You mean to tell me they actually issued that book to you for students in seminary? Good well, I mean, it was, it was kind of a standard reading among the Presbyterian ministers, and... Uh, you know, they kind of one of our one of the ministers that went to our church at that time. Uh, he had he had uh, there was a split somewhere in Greenville, and there there were his kind of like half of his congregation came to worship with us at the time. And um, you know, he was he was given us books from his library, and uh, he wanted us to have uh, he wanted us he wanted to make sure we had Wiley's uh, huge volumes on the, on the history of Protestantism. God bless him. God bless him. That's why I learned the greatness of Knox. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just when he refused to give the uh, communion to the infidels there, to the levelers, to the... Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just a wonderful work. Anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked. But, yeah. That's okay. It's okay. Uh, and here here comes another one of these... I don't know what we should call these guys. These uh, these guys who... I mean, they're they, they're kind of going along the Nazi fascist line. Um, yes, yes. See, hey, let, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you for one second, uh, Jake. Right. On this, right. the, the guy, he, this guy quoted Hillary Bellock. Okay. okay. Hillary Bellock was a fanatical Roman Catholic disinformation historian. Okay. And I've read several of his works, and it's a terrible twist 
of history, and that was his purpose, to rewrite history and to twist it. So he's a notorious liar. So to quote yeah. Hillary Bellock on anything of substance, you're going down the wrong road, and you can disprove yeah. most of what he says. Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe we should call these guys disinformation agents or good Jesuit coadjutors. Absolutely. Um, they, they they love to say that Ignatius Loyola was a was a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> they, they just they're they're upset. Like uh, some of the more honest ones, and I I listened to your debate that you had with that gentleman. Um, uh, what was his name now? A couple years ago, was it um, on on whether the Jews or the Jesuits? Michael Collins Piper. Yeah, Michael Collins Piper. Thank you. Yeah, and. Um, I remember listening to that, and some of the, some of these guys are not as obstinately, you know, stubborn like he was. They'll actually look at the history of this, and they'll admit the Jesuits are huge players in the New World Order, and so, and so in order to make it fit their theory, they have to make Ignatius Loyola a Jew. Uh, sure. Every, every standard work that I've read on this man on biography that I've read says that he was a Spanish man. He was from a Basque noble family. He was not a Jew, and he actually stated in one of his works he wished he was a Jew. Uh, what, what what do you do? You know of any uh, sources that claim that Ignatius Loyola was a Jew, or at least an ethnic Jew? No, not one. And I'll no. tell you. That this is another lie of the Jesuits, because you see, once people start to catch on that the Jesuits are ruling everything, then the the only military response to that is that they can't disprove it. Yeah. There is military response to say, well, he's a Jew, and the Jews run the Jesuits, and therefore I told you the Jews run everything. But they will do this in the face of the facts that Loyola was number one, the Spanish nobleman of mm -hmm. the House yeah. of Loyola. Yeah. He was a military warrior. He was a he was a Spanish Templar. Um, he was he was of noble blood, and yeah. uh, he hated the Jews, according to Boyd Barrett. And Boyd Barrett was a was a Jesuit for many years. He left the order. He never he came to know the Lord. He was never saved. But he wrote a book, two books. One of them is called the Jesuit Enigma. Okay. And the other book he called another book he wrote is called Rome Stoops to Conquer. Okay. In those books, it tells you that Loyola never said any good thing or anything of such of a sort of about Jews. Oh, okay. okay. And Francis Xavier says in Rome Stoops to Conquer, he said, give me a place where there are no Muslims or Jews. Yeah. And Francis Xavier was Loyola's right-hand man who went to, you know, uh, India. Oh, you know, uh, right here, here, in my, here in my hometown of Louisville, uh, we have quite a, Je a Jesuit hive here. We have Bellarmine University, and then we also oh, wow. have the most, the most well-known high school here uh, is Xavier High School, and it is a hive of Jesuits. Yes. Oh, yes. And, folks, I just want you to know that that, that kind of attitude towards the Jews is traditional in, and choretic that, 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 in, in Roman Catholic Theology. Okay, I just want to give you two classic quotes from uh, major early church Roman Catholic uh, theologians. This is coming from Justin Martyr in his Dialogue with Trifo, chapter 16, quotation. For the circumcision according to the flesh, which is from Abraham, was given for a sign that you may be separated from other nations. And he's talking to Jews, by the way. And from us, and that you alone may suffer that which you now justly suffer, that your land may be desolate, and your cities burned with fire, and that strangers may eat your fruit in your presence, and not one of you may go up to Jerusalem. For you are not recognized among the rest of men by any other mark than your fleshly circumcision. For none of you, I suppose, will venture to say that God neither did nor does foresee the events which are future, nor foreordained his deserts for each one. Accordingly, these things have happened to you in fairness and justice, for you have slain the just one and his prophets before him. Now, here is the the most popular Roman Catholic theologian that was used during the Nazi regimes in Germany. His name is John Chrysostom. 
he was a notorious anti-Semite. This man was unbelievable. He, he, wrote, he wrote numerous works against the Jews. His most famous works, most quoted by the Nazis, was his eight homilies against the Jews. Okay, And you can read the, the, the Nazi use of this work in Walter LaCour's book, The Changing Face of Antisemitism. And this is just one quote from uh, Chrysostom's homilies, quote, For they brought the books of Moses and the prophets along with them into the synagogue, not to honor them, but to outrage them with dishonor. When they say that Moses and the prophets knew not Christ and said nothing about his coming, what greater outrage could they do to those holy men than to accuse them of failing to recognize their master, than to say that those saintly prophets are partners of their impiety? And so it is that we must hate both them and their synagogue all the more because of their offensive treatment of those holy men. Okay? The seething hatred that, that Chrysostom has for the Jews, it's, it's all over his writings. It's all over. Now, this brings us to another very important issue. What about Luther? What about Luther and his book, The Jews and Their Lies? I think you've written some on that issue, have you not, Eric? Yes, I have. Um, well, number one, I came out in my book and said plainly that R Luther never wrote on the Jews in their lives. Yeah. That was released three years after his death. So he never wrote the thing. Supposedly it was in 1543, but it was after, after that. It was after Luther died, because Luther never said such a thing, and I'll tell you why. You go to his commentary on Romans, and he never writes anything like that. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I have Lenker's work. I have Lenker's work where he, where he quotes Luther in saying that obviously Israel will be restored and Lord haste the day. I have it in my PowerPoint. Yeah. So Luther never wrote on the Jews and their lives for two reasons. Number one, the theology in on the Jews and their lives, because the, uh, on the Jews and their lives teaches work salvation. Luther hated work salvation. He came yeah. to know the Lord for Romans 117, the just shall live by faith, as you know. He hated sure, yeah. anybody that had in any kind of work salvation. And that's what right. you see all through in the Jews and their lives. Yep. The second reason why you can reject it as a work of Luther is the whole language of on the Jews and their lives. Luther didn't have that style. Oh, okay. It was not his style. So those are the two reasons why somebody will get... I'll write something off and publish on it, but those are the two primary reasons. And then, and in Jews in their lives, he's quoting from uh, the, the the Latin the Latin Psalms. Uh, what is it? Made to mayor, something like that. The Latin Psalm, the, the misery. Luther doesn't quote from that. He's quoting yeah. from the pure Bible, or he'll quote from the Hebrew, but he's not going to quote any Latin. Uh, yeah. Jerome's Latin Vulgate, you know. Yeah. So yeah. all these things have the despicable flavor of the Jesuits, and they're masters right. at. Uh, at um, having a, what do you call them, um, uh, uh, books written by them and attributed to other people. Counterfeits. Mein Kampf is another one. Hoover's the great. Hoover's the great deceit. Another one. I mean, uh, uh, what is it? ISIS unveiled and the secret doctrine by Blavatsky. That's another couple of manuscripts written by Jesuits. They're the masters of counterfeiting, writing books and attributed to their coaches. Yeah, yeah, or absolutely. <laughs> Do um do do you have a possible name that you think may have done it uh, a certain individual, um just maybe a guess maybe best guess of who you think did it. Well, I don't know because see at the time the Jesuits were just getting started. They were founded okay. in 1534. They were brought into the papacy in 1540. Um, Luther dies what in 1546 I believe. They say he wrote it in 1543. That's one of the first things they attack is I, it wouldn't surprise me if, if Xavier or Salmoran or, or one of those guys uh, or, or wrote it themselves. Maybe abortion. Yeah. Well, uh, this leads to another issue, and th th this is from the Catholic Gazette. It was written in 1936. This is kind of the holy grail of our Jesuit coadjutors here. They point to this as the definitive proof that the Jews were behind the Protestant Reformation. Um, they, they quote this document. They think that they've gotten a hold of this document here that was supposedly being uh, distributed among Jews. 
uh, let me give you just the kind of the preface to this uh, this little article in the Catholic Gazette. It says that there has been and still is a Jewish problem no one can deny. Since the rejection of Israel 1,900 years ago, the Jews have scattered in every direction. And in spite of difficulties and even persecution, they have established themselves as a power in nearly every nation of Europe. Jacobs, in his Jewish contribu contributions to civilization, glories in the fact that without detriment to their own racial unity and international character, the Jews have been able to spread their doctrines and increase their political, social, and economic influence among the nations. In view of this Jewish problem, which affects the Catholic Church in a special way, we publish the following. Amazing extracts from a number of speeches recently made under the auspices of a Jewish society in Paris. The name of our informant must remain concealed. <laughs> uh, he is personally known. To, yeah, he is personally known to us by reason of his peculiar relations with the Jews. At the present time, we have agreed not to disclose his identity nor to give any further details of the Paris meeting beyond the following extracts. Yada yada, and it goes down here. Let me give you the section which touches on the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> Quotation. Okay, so here's the speech. He's quoting – the Catholic Gazette is now quoting from this speech by this Jew. Okay. Quotation. Okay. Martin Luther yielded to the influence of his Jewish friends, and again by Jewish authority and with Jewish finance, his plot against the Catholic Church met with success. Thanks to our <laughs> pro yeah. Thanks to our propaganda – to our theories of liberalism and to our misrepresentations of freedom, the minds of many among the Gentiles were ready to welcome the Reformation. They separated from the church to fall into our snare, and thus the Catholic Church has been very sensibly weakened, and her authority over the kings and Gentiles has been reduced almost to naught. <clears throat> this, is, this, is, this is rich right here. We are grateful to Protestants for their loyalty to our wishes. <laughs> Although most of them are, in the sincerity of their faith, unaware of their loyalty to us, <laughs> we are grateful to them for the wonderful help they are giving us in our fight against the strongholds of Christian <laughs> civilization and in our preparations for the advent of our supremacy over the whole world and over the kingdoms of the Gentiles. Okay, so it's just it just goes on with this propaganda. It doesn't actually tell us who these friends were of Martin Luther that influenced him. I, I have I don't know of it. Do you know who they could possibly be talking about? I, I've never come across yeah, I've never come across of any influential Jew in any historical writing on Luther. Neither have I. None. So, so yeah. therefore the question is, who financed Luther? Yeah, yeah. Because he had it. Well we know it was Frederick the Elector. Yeah. Yeah. Frederick the Elector paid him to trans, helped him, kept him fed and clothed when he was Knight George at Wartburg Castle for ten yeah. months to bring the Bible into German. There were no yeah. Jews involved in that. Yeah. So all this since 1936, when you read this, this is the Jesuits in Europe seeking to unite Protestants and Catholics together against the Jews. That's what and they want. Yeah, and that's, that's right. Popular. Exactly right. And folks, I just and want you to know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. They come up with this bogus Jewish author that's saying these things. They do the same thing with that one other guy with uh, Friedman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, they're going to treat all these terrible things to the Jews, and, and they're using one of their court Jews to write it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Without any historical documentation. Yeah. And for our listeners, I want you to know this is exactly what we are faced with right now. And the, the right. Jesuits the Jesuits have done this like in the last couple centuries. In the, in the beginning part of the 1800s, the 19th century, and Eric has done a great job of documenting this in his, in his work, Vatican Assassins. There were – you have the revitalization of the Jesuit order in 1814. Right after this, you have these two real big meetings that happen. Uh, for, you have the, the, what's called the Council of Vienna, the Treaty of Verona, and then there's this other thing called this Cherry Council in Italy. And overseeing all of this is this Roman – he was a representative of the Holy Roman Empire. His name was Prince von Metternich. He was over this huge agenda in Europe and even over here in the United States because one of his good buddies was Charles Sumner. Charles That's Sumner, right. that – Wicked, that wicked, filthy Yankee abolitionist over here yeah. who is going to be yeah. responsible for the revitalization of monarchical powers in our land. That's right. And, 
That's right. I have documented I wrote a book on this on my blog. It's for free. I put it on my blog. It's called The End of the Antebellum South. I spent about 1,500 hours putting this book together. I did, I did this oh. all last year. I, I Eric's book was an inspiration for me to write this book on the Antebellum South. And um, and I can by, by the way, by, by the way, brother, just let me add this before I forget. Yeah, I discovered this connection between Metternich and, and Scumner, which I call Charles Scumner. Yeah, in yeah. in a in, in the library F and M library in Lancaster, back in the Marshall College Library, in the basement of the books that were in, uh, they're locked up and they're not allowed to be um, checked out. Yeah, you can yeah, yeah. They're, they're part of their exhibit. And it was a three volume set on uh, Metternich. So I thought, well, yeah. Lord, I wonder what this is here. I got one of the volumes down, and just in the providence of God, it turned me right there where Metternich was meeting with Charles Sumner, yeah. a, an American uh, senator right there. And I said, this is the connection yeah. of the radical red Republicans to the Congress of Vienna. That's right. Wow. That's right. So It's also, it's right it's also in his letters. Talk- oh, okay. The letters of Charles Sumner, he talks about it. I've got it. I've got it quoted and linked on my blog. It's on Google Books. Um, uh-huh. So, so okay, this is the first attempt that we have here. At least one of the. I mean, obviously, the, the Jesuits tried to regain the Holy Roman Empire with the Thirty Years' War. They failed. You have the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, and this huge explosion of culture and progress over in Europe because of the Protestant Reformation, yes. its influence into society. I, 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 for your, for your listeners too, Greg, before I forget this, remember yeah. any modern history class that you take in any university, they will always tell you the beginning of the modern era is 1648 with the right. Peace of Westphalia. Always. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, look at the big players that come out right after this. Uh, I mean, Voltaire. I mean, shake, I mean, my, my beloved Queen Bess, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, she has a golden age of her own in, in England with with uh, sure. with all, the, yeah. But uh, with 1648 uh, is is that's the real kicker all over Europe, and um, so we have that they, they they completely fail, and then you know they fail with their attempts to regain powers in uh, England with uh, the fall of. Uh, that filthy uh, Duke of York, uh, James II, and when when, when William and Mary That's take right. over, and That's then right. in the eighteen yeah, in the 1800s they try it again with Metternich. Uh, it's blocked here in America with the Monroe Doctrine, and then That's right. in the 1900s they try it again, folks. When when Hitler called his little regime over there the Third Reich. He was telling you that he was a, he was he was trying to continue something. It tell you can go on Wikipedia and read this. The Third Reich was right. a revitalization of the Holy Roman Empire. This is not a conspiracy right. theory, folks. This is standard right. history. All right. So yeah. what? And, and, and further, yeah, yeah, And furthermore, Drake, remember when his invasion of Russia? What does he call it? <laughs> Operation Barbarossa. Oh, okay. Who's yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbarossa? He's the German know. Crusader of the Third Crusade. Oh wow! Wow! Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's huge. That's huge. Huge. Yeah. So what what we are we we are here uh, involved with now uh, here in the 20th century? I want you to know this, listener. And I know I probably got some of you Jesuit coadjutors, and I don't want to I don't want to be too derogatory with you because you're my brother. Some of you guys are in the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Some of you guys. Support the Confederacy. You're white men from the South. You're my brethren. I love you. Okay, I'm. You, you, you're being deceived. You're, you're you're being drawn away from what you need into this deceit. You're going to be used as cannon fodder by the Jesuit order to do their bidding here in our country, and, and th- you, you turn away from these deceits. They are trying. To, they, they, we have this huge crisis. The Jesuits have made way now for the last century or more to, for the white nations, the white European nations of the Protestant Reformation to be completely surrounded, completely invaded with all these different foreigners coming over here with all their religions and all of their cultures and stuff. Yep. And we, we yep. are sitting here, we, we are in panic mode and and. Right. We have we have been brought to this place where we 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 have to do something. <laughs> we we can't just we right. can't just sit here and do something. And the Jesuits are taking full advantage of this. And what they're going to do is they're using this 
to, they're using this to unite the Protestant white men and the Catholic white men together. And That's they right. are using to, to revitalize the Holy Roman Empire. That's right. That's right. Well, look at look at what they call they depart, called it the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you have anything talking about a homeland, you know it's either Nazi or communist, and the Jesuits run both Nazism and communism. Yeah. yeah. So that's going to be our holy office of the Inquisition, the Department of what I call Homeland Security. Yeah. They're going to absorb all the intelligence communities. I know that they're going to absorb the FBI one of these days, and yeah. so it's going to be the Pope Super Gestapo here in North America composed of Protestants and Catholics, as was the SS, but the mm -hmm. primary leaders will be Roman Catholics, as it was the SS. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in, later on in this uh, this, this little uh, propaganda piece uh, with, with this uh, Catholic Gazette in 1936, it talks about how the how that we are, and by we, I'm talking about as if I'm the author of that uh, work, that Jewish work. Says he says we are the masters of class warfare, and that was that was the kicker for me when as soon as I read that I was like, I that is a Jesuit writing this right here. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you know what that sounds like. It sounds like the protocols. Yeah, yeah. Protocols. <laughs> That's exactly what the protocols. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said before in my book and talk with you about, the Jesuits wrote the protocols, and it is documented by ex-Roman Catholic priest who became a missionary, a, a preacher to the Catholic people in New York City. His name was Leo Lehman. Leo yeah. Lehman yeah. wrote this tremendous work behind the dictators, and in that he said the Jesuits wrote the protocols, and he proves yeah. it. Yeah. And folks, uh, I just want to – because I, I – as Eric does, he he devotes his his episodes and his broadcast to white men, and I do the same thing. And I primarily devote it to my beloved Southern white men, and, and especially to those men who are the original stock of this land. Uh, I my, right. my ancestors came here 400 years ago. We were part of the original Jamestown colony. We're running for our lives from Charles the First over there in England when he was persecuting Protestants. He was continuing the policies of his father, James the First, with his Black Axe, but he was persecuting oh, Protestants. Sure. We came, he, he came over here, we came over here, and my fifth great-grandfather fought with George Washington, the Revolutionary War. He then fought with the Battle of Kings Hill, and my third great-grandfather fought through the Confederacy. And, and I, I am a part of the original, the original stock of this land here with the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and I will be damned. Before I let, and you, and I want you. To, I know you feel the same way I do, brother. I know I've seen it in your eyes when we are at our meetings. We are going to be damned before we let this happen to our country. We are not going to. We are not going to relieve our religion. And we are not going to give over the inheritance of our fathers to all these That's foreigners right. with their gods and their religions. No, we're not doing that. But we also don't want to get into what the Jesuits want. The Jesuits want this hateful, bloodthirsty. Mentality, so that we'll fall in line with their bloodthirsty uh, fascist regime that they're bringing up here. We don't want that. We want to stay away from that. That's right. And the other thing we got to be concerned about is we can't be driven into hating the black man. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What we have to do is we have to hate the separation of our race. Yeah. areas where our own white nation, blacks have their own black nation. And uh, well, those that want to race mix, they can continue to stay here. But we have to racially separate under nationhood, which is a biblical maxim. Yeah, I agree. Anybody, that calls, agree. Racial, anybody that calls for racial separation today, they want to immediately tag, he's a racist, he hates yeah. black people, and, 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 and the blacks don't want to racially separate, they're racist, they hate white people, and the vast majority that you hear, like Shabiz of the New Black Panthers or Farrakhan, why, of course they hate black people, because they're working for the Pope to incite a black-on-white race war. That's what That's right. they want. And I tell you, I tell you, Eric, I, just this last week, I had a friend of mine from California. She's a Latino girl. We went to college together. And last year, we were talking, and I told her, and on, I'm, I was just looking at my blog. On June 7th was my first entry on my blog. This is when I first started to lose. I've lost about 75% of my readers over this issue. And I've, oh, yeah. started put, I've started putting on my blog that there's going to be a race war here. I, had, I, I listened to your series. I listened to your works that you did, and I did my own research, and I wrote a number of things on this. And I became completely convinced that you're right about this. 
And and two days ago, my friend from California calls me up. I haven't heard from her for a long time. I haven't. She calls me up and she goes, Drake, this race war has started. She lives in Los Angeles. They had a huge yep. riots over there in the last few days. And she's like, well, after, after, the, after the after the, the Dimmerman decision, yeah. Yeah. yeah, she she's like, I thought you were crazy. I thought you were racist and stuff, but you're right. This stuff is happening. I'm like, I know. Right. And I, I talked to a black man. I talked to a black and big black guy yesterday at the Lancaster Bible College. I decided to go over there as my old aunt, where I graduated. And I wanted to go to the library where they moved the library and they built a new building. Well, I went in there and I thought, oh, I got to see this library because that's yeah. that's the place of real wealth, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> as I was sitting there. Yeah, that, that's where all the nuggets of gold are. And I found what I wanted to read, but in the providence of God, there was a big black guy that came over and wanted to talk to me I, out, of the, out of the blue. So I said, okay. So we sat and talked for a while, and I told him all this. I said, the Jesuit, I said, I teach in the Jesuit order. I said, they're fomenting a race war, and they want to have the majority savage blacks, which I consider 75 to 80% of the black community to be majority savage blacks. And 20 to 25 percent are the civil minority blacks, and they many of them believe the Bible. He said, yeah. "You're right." He said, "I'm having a problem myself in the inner city here in Lancaster." I said, "Well, just know this: the Jesuits are using their agents in the black community to foment a race war in every major city in this country. Yeah. And when it starts to break forth, millions of white people are going to die." Within the, next, within the first 20, 30 days, and then the Department of Rural Land Security will come out to the rescue and enslave everybody. Yep. Yep, I remember telling this to a man uh, last year, as a black gentleman, and he didn't, he was not a Bible believer, and it, it was pretty tall, it was pretty awful. Uh, I, 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 it was, I thought I was going to have to run for my, <laughs> my life here. I, I told him these things that I believe, and he 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 got really mad because he, he I think he he figured that I was telling the truth, but he just didn't want to have yeah. to have to face the reality yeah. of it. But uh, See, that's the problem. My... Go Excuse me, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that's the problem with my... dealing with that's the problem with dealing with many blacks. Blacks they want to go to fists right away. They want to fight right away. Well, if that's what you want to do. We can do that too. But see, that's never how you talk something through to a logical conclusion. And so because they're easily excitable to violence, they, it's very difficult to reach them with these facts because they've been brainwashed to hate all white people That's right. and are not thankful for the, for the conveniences they have in North America because of white men and their inventions and Jews that aided us in our inventions that we didn't persecute. More blacks are waking up to this. I have two strong black supporters who are in their communities advocating against the new Black Panthers, against the... the uh, the uh, Nation of Islam, and are calling for racial separation and the nationhood for their own black nation. So I believe this is starting to move even among the blacks now. Yeah, and I want to – I want to uh, just a short – I don't want to go into my book on this, but I want you to know, uh, if, you, if you're a listener and you're, you're a black man, I have went to great pains to document for you with numerous primary sources and some secondary sources – that the colony of Virginia, where my ancestors came from, which was the, 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 it was, was like the headquarters of the South, we did everything that we possibly could to stop that damn slave trade from coming to our land. That's right. Everything we possibly That's right. could. King George shoved that thing right down our throats here. And he right. and, and Thomas Jefferson in our original constitution says he did it to start De a race De over De here. De original declaration. That's right. That's right. Well, it, it, it's it's also in the original Constitution as well. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah. I, I know it's in the Declaration because I have it in Blake's History of Slavery and the Slave Trade. For any of yeah. you listening that want to get the real history of the slavery and the slave trade, W. O. Blake is the classic. Yeah. The history yeah, of absolutely. slavery and the slave trade, and it has Jefferson's whole work right in there. He says they put this execrable slave trade upon us. That yeah. the king has refused our colonial legislators to forbid, and then he's exciting this, the blacks against the, our, the white population for our destruction. Exactly the same policy of today. That's right. That's right. And I've 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 documented as well on my uh, response. I did a lengthy response to two uh, university professors. I think it's in Idaho. Now it was it was a few months ago. They were in Idaho, and they and they point out. They, well, they ask uh, these two southern gentlemen that wrote a defense of the South why all the slave uh, rebellions happened here in the early colonies. If we were so good to the blacks, why is it that they, they, they rebelled? I have documented for you the Jesuits were behind this. We had one group of them were, came over here from the Congo where they, were, they used to be a, a, like a reduction over there in Africa. 
And they, uh-huh. they were Jesuit trained to do this. And then you have uh, Nat uh, uh, Turner. Uh, he was he was accompanied by two French Jacobins to do what he did, and he even he even says in his own writings that his master was good to him, but he had been taught this liberation theology crap, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment. We're going to talk about where liberation theology came from. He had been taught this stuff, and he was incited to these riots by these French Jacobin gentlemen who remained unnamed. I haven't found a name for them yet, but they talk about yeah. it in his book, in his own work. But for the listener's benefit, for the listener's benefit, remember the French, French Jacobins were totally run by the Jesuits. So right. One of the foremost Jacobins was Abbe Saez, and he was right. on the directory. Abbe yes. Saez later goes on to be the, the first, second council of the third man, three man consulate, and he's the advisor to Napoleon. Jacobins right. and the Jacobins were completely in the hands of the Jesuits. That's right. All of the slave rebellions that I have studied in the South were inspired by the French Revolution. And Eric John Phelps has showed in his work, uh, Vatican Assassins, very clearly, the Jesuits were behind the, the, the French Revolution. You look at all the major players in France, Robespierre, Abbe Says, Voltaire, they're all Jesuits or Jesuit trained men, all of them. And uh, there's another one named Diderot as well. But anyway, I want, I want to get... I, I wanted and, to get to and, this. and then the crowning event too, Drake. Don't forget Napoleon. Napoleon oh, yeah, was trained Napoleon. by him, and he yeah. came right out of Corsica, where all the Jesuits were confined by the by uh, the King of France when they were suppressed in 1764. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to get to this quote here by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And uh, any any of you men from the South, you know who Harriet Beecher Stowe is. And I have I have uh, uh, read a numerous different history books uh, that when when Abraham Lincoln first met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he looked at her and he said, "This is the little woman that started this great war." She wrote the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I want to quote for you a section out of the key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, Part 4, Chapter Number 9, page 485. Quotation. Our admiration of some of the laborers who have conducted the system is very great. So also is our admiration of many of the Jesuit missionaries who have spread uh, the Roman Catholic religion among our aboriginal tribes. Unquote. Cool. Is the it that the interesting? Yes. Wow, she was that's a, huge. Yeah. That's huge, Drake. Yeah. I want see, here's to another thing. We gotta, but another thing we got to remember about her too. She never was in the South. Yeah. She yeah. never went to the South. How would she know anything about what's going on in the South? Yeah. Yeah. She She's a coadjutor, and you know what? She, and, and another thing is too. She and Victoria had a little had a little trinket. She had one half, and Victoria had the other. So that shows you the Jesuits were in complete and total control of the administration of Queen Victoria because they were busy using the British intelligence to foment the war between the states, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, could, I, I don't know all the details of that. I'll definitely have to look into that. So yeah. this, this brings us to another era, okay? So we, we've, we've touched on, especially American white men, we've touched on the Civil War. We've told you the, the men behind the Civil War and the re, regaining of monarchical powers by the Roman Catholic elements coming out of uh, Middle Europe with Prince, uh, Prince von Metternich. We've showed you with Sumner. And by the way, you've documented this, Eric. I've documented this as well in my blog. Thaddeus Stevens, my friends, has a Bedside conversion to Roman Catholicism. I've, I've That's put right. it from a book That's on right. my blog. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So the sisters of charity, the, bl- the yeah. black sisters of charity, by the way, they are the ones that administered his baptism on his deathbed. Yeah. I have that document on my PowerPoint. The other thing is, I just found out in a great book. It's probably the best book written on the Southern Con- uh, Reconstruction, telling the truth. It's called The Tragic Era. Okay. In that book, The Tragic Era, it tells you that Thaddeus Stevens' best friend in Lancaster was a priest, and he used to take long walks with him. <laughs> That's and Thaddeus, Thaddeus Stevens' uh, mulatto concubine, Lydia Smith, was a Roman Catholic, and she was constantly at the feet of her priest, probably getting instructions for Thad. And she yeah. is buried in a Roman Catholic cemetery in Lancaster called St. Mary's Cemetery. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
All right, so the next period that I want to focus attention on is the Civil Rights era, okay? And this is a big one with the Southern uh, Jesuit coadjutors who think that the Jews are behind everything, okay? They'll say the Jews are behind everything. I want to point your attention, my friend, to two gentlemen. One, his name is Theodore Hesber, and the second gentleman you need to read about is a man named John Lafarge, Jr., John LaFarge Jr. is the mentor of the mentor of Martin Luther King. Uh, Eric has documented that. Eric has documented that in his book. I've documented that on my blog in great detail. And you can also read about how Martin Luther King met with Pope Paul VI. He also had a connection sure. with him as well. Yeah, go ahead. The book I was looking for, I can't find it on my shelf, of course, is John Lafarge and his book on the Catholic Interpretation. Yeah. We get a little feedback here. Um, but John Lafarge, see, the, the Civil Rights Movement really began in the 30s. Yeah. And it began with John Lafarge, and you can get that book that he wrote about it. And Lafarge, he also is the tutor of... A. Philip Randolph. Yeah, yeah, A. Philip a. Randolph. A. Philip Randolph was the head of the group of sleeping car porters, and they want full integration and the whole nine yards. Whereas in the 30s, during FDR's early administration, there there was a movement among decent and respectable blacks for a back to Africa movement. Right. Yeah. FDR, FDR, advised by Edmund Walsh, Jesuit Edmund Walsh, killed it. Yeah. There can be no permitted back to Africa movement in this country. So therefore, you have Walsh, you have John Lafarge. Lafarge dies in 63, shortly before the Kennedy assassination. You have those two key Jesuits pushing this interracialism because that's exactly what the Jesuits sought to do with the first Reconstruction. The yep. Civil Rights Movement and all of this is nothing more than the second Reconstruction in this country. The yep. race mix, miscegenate, amalgamate, mulattoize this country so that there will be no strong white population with a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other led by patriotic yeah. statesmen who resist the Jesuit tyranny in their state or in Washington. Yeah. And uh, for any and listeners out... Go ahead. I wanna, by I wanna, the way, I wanna, let me... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Let me say... Okay, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to uh, say that sounds like a radical <laughs> statement. It sounds like a radical statement, but you can read the almost these very words by Dabney in his great work, The Defense of Virginia in the South. He said, the policy of our conquerors is to race mix us so there will never be the resistance of righteous Virginia freemen that make our conquerors quake in their boots. Yeah. He says that we were going to be miscegenated in with this vile st uh, stream from the ferns of Africa. Well, vile stream from the Africa. So those were his words. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. So uh, just want just want you to know, guys, and I, I, I have lost about 75% of my readers over these racial issues. And uh, just in case you think we're just a bunch of uh, white bigots just, uh, you know, just uh, ven venting our hatred on the radio waves, I want you to read a small section out of uh, – a, 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 it was like a kind of a catechism that Frederick Engels wrote. It was called The Principles of Communism. He wrote this work in 1847. I've seen some versions when it, where it's in section 21, or some versions where it's in section 22. It's one of those two versions, one of those two sections of that work. And you will read where he states very clearly at the very outset, that's laying the foundation for what communism is. He says we have to integrate and miscegenate the races as an application of his view of property. Just like you dissolve the classes in property, we have to dissolve the class distinctions in race as well. Folks, the idea, the, the idea that a person lives for their tribe, for their race, their religion, for their kith and kin, this is as old as man himself. This is as natural as it gets. The people who invent this idea, yeah, and, and, and who, who invents these ideas? That we that we shouldn't care about our race and prefer our race and prefer our own kind, the communists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to mention something here, Drake. That's only for the white man. The white oh, man yeah. cannot prefer his own kind. The white man cannot prefer his own race. The blacks are encouraged to prefer, to, uh, prefer their own race, and they should. 
And the Hispanics are encouraged to, uh, to be, prefer their own race, and they should. But whenever a white man does that, why, he's the demon devil himself, because we're not allowed that liberty. Because we're, and, the, uh, ones that resist, we're the ones that resist the Pope's white power structure. That's right. And uh, you, you will find a, a liberal I, – I go to the University of Louisville and talk to college kids about this stuff, and they, they, they freak out on me. And you will – it's very interesting watching the hypocrisy of this, of this line of thinking because w when they talk to black people, when they're trying to get them agitated against whites, race is as real and existent a thing as anything, as oxygen itself. They want them to know that race exists and your race has been persecuted. But when they talk yeah, to sure. white men, to white men who want to prefer their own race, they look at a white man and they say, ah, race is just a convention. It doesn't really exist. It's just kind of, a, kind of an abstraction that we've invented in our minds. It is total hypocrisy. They don't believe what they're saying. No. And, and, here, and here's, the, a, here's the proof of the pudding, Drake. If you're a white man and you ever live around black people like I have, I had a black girlfriend when I was in high school. I used to go to Parchester Village, which is all black next to my all white Montalban Manor. I know what it's like living around black people. And race to them is number one. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And to white to, to, to the white liberals, they know that and they know that they have to uh appeal. Uh, to that priority that they have in their communities. So this yeah. this brings us this brings us to another important thing. Who are the people that create the all of this this liberation theology? Uh, Eric has written so much about this. Eric, can you give us kind of a synopsis of the Jesuit order in South America and uh, how they fought against the, uh, the the Portuguese and the Spanish? Oh, okay. Um, you mean in the 1700s? That time? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, just remember the Jesuits had their 59 reductions in, the, in what we would call Brazil today and Paraguay, and uh, it, it encompassed 300,000 grainy Indian slaves. In fact, my former student in my class, he's a professor on Brazilian history, especially pertaining to the reductions. Mm -hmm. And so he told me that absolutely they had these, these huge colonies. They were making buku money for the Jesuits. It was mm -hmm. each according to his ability and to each according to his need. So it was the principles of communism there perfected on the Paraguayan reductions from 1609 to 1759 for 150 years. The Jesuits would take all their manufacturing, all the violins, all the clocks, all the hides, the tallow, the Paraguayan herb, the silver of Venezuela. They would send all this into international commerce and trade with their black ships. And these black ships, it was the second largest fleet in the world, second only to the Dutch. And they created the huge banks in Europe, especially the one out of Marseille and Paris in France. They had these huge banks in Europe from the huge trade that they had in South America for 150 years. And then they would finance their wars, like the 30 Years' War and other yeah. wars that they would hatch out against the Protestant nations to destroy us. Well, when the Jesuits were suppressed in uh, 1774 by France and 1767 by Spain, they were all kicked out. So in the 1800s, they were getting back their power so that in the 1900s, they are going to pretend to be on the side of the people, and they will use their French Jesuit, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, to be the big promoter of what is called liberation theology. And liberation mm -hmm. theology is nothing more than uh, rising up against anybody that has any property or land, overthrowing them, uh, so that some ultimately some dictator can come to power. That's the end result of the military dictator. Well, this liberation theology is now what's called black theology by a guy named Cohn, a black liberal, a black hater of white men and a professor. I can't remember the place. I think it's Princeton. And black theology, which is what Jeremiah Wright preaches to Barry Davis Obama, it's nothing more than Jesuit liberation theology, which is the imposition of socialist communism that, that then results in a military dictator. Yeah, and um, the the Jesuits told uh, the natives uh, in South America that white men had devils in their bodies, that's and right. that they would eat that they white would devils. eat their children. Yeah, that's right, you white devils. Folks, that was pinned. That was originated in Jesuit propaganda. Okay, 
And And not uh, only... The source for that... And, and the source for that is R. W. Thompson's work, The Footprints of the Jesuits, written in 1896, right. on the section of Paraguay. Yeah. And folks, the Catholic, the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia admits this. That you can go to the New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia. There's an article called Reductions of Paraguay. The first, in the section that goes conditions of property, it says, and I quote: "The economic basis was a sort of communism. It wasn't a sort of communism. It was communism." And th- right. this is right. where this is where communism is perfected, folks. The Jews didn't perfect communism. The Jesuits did. No, no. This, this is standard That's right. history. Yeah. That's and, right. The Jesuits are the authors and perfectors of communism. They, who are the ones that were behind Fabian socialism and socialism in England that ultimately was imported into Russia in the 1917 uh, revolution? The Jesuits. The Jesuits. Yeah. They, and they they named Fabian soldiers after a Roman general. Yeah, yeah. And this is nothing new, really, in the history of uh, in the history of Roman Catholicism. Thomas Aquinas writes about it in his Summa Theologica. Uh, Thomas More writes about it in his book Utopia. And uh, I have shown from the writings of Frederick Hegel that Frederick Hegel uh, bases his dialectical principle. Off the Roman scholastic doctrine of filioque, uh, the the <laughs> yes, I have documented that very clearly. The Roman no, Catholic no, doctrines, no. the Roman Catholic doctrines are the base. The Roman Catholicism is the basis of all of our problems, folks. I'm sorry, it's That's not right. the news. That's it's absolutely not. right. And you know, you talk about communism there. The Jesuits and the, uh, Romanism was perfecting communism. I went to the Jesuit. Uh, uh, spiritual center not far from here in uh, in Warnersville, Pennsylvania. It, yep. it used to be a uh, novitiate. Well, there's yep. a cemetery there, and I always drive down and take a look at the cemetery see if I see any new additions. And uh, they completely reworked it, but all and, and all the, the headstones are, are, are laid out, uh, arcing from one end to another. It's a vaginal shape. Yeah. So it's the vaginal Virgin Mary shape that we're going to bury all our Jesuits in the structure. Yeah. Yeah. All, all the Jesuit headstones have three yeah. things on them, or four things. The name, the day they were born, the day they entered into the order, and the day they died. And yeah. all the names on the Jesuit headstones are all white on a black base. All the names are in all capital letters because yeah. they're military soldiers. So oh, yeah. it's all universal equality. There's no no different headstones. They're all the same. It's completely and totally common. Yeah, and uh, I I have one of, one of the headquarters of liberal theology in America. It's right here in my hometown of Louisville. It's the PCUSA, the so-called Presbyterian Church of the United States of America. They they have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the history of Presbyterianism, but somehow they get away with calling themselves <laughs> Presbyterian. Who knows how they do yeah. that? But I, I like to go in their bookstore and kind of play around, and I'm curious about what they're teaching their people every now and then. And so I buy some of their theology books from time to time, and one book that I bought recently is kind of a consensus of liberal theology on a, a smattering of different theological issues. And I keep running into this quote, this guy here, his name is Gustavo Gutierrez, okay? He is a Dominican monk. He is, yeah. Yeah, he is he is a ma- he is like the master liberation theologian right now, okay? And he was trained by a Jesuit named Henry de Lubac. Uh that's L U B A C. He was a French Jesuit. And he yeah. is he th- these guys are the masters of the racial liberation theology guys. It's not Jews. It's not they're not Jews. Right. They're, they're Jesuit and Roman Catholic Jesuit trained monks within the Roman Catholic Church who were behind all this. And th- this is this is quite fascinating. If you study the history of South America, we we've given you kind of a, a small synopsis. Who where where did our recent pope come from? Came from, okay? Where did he come from? He came from South America. And uh if you if you know anything about the Falklands War, he was uh, a, a, an advisor to one of the, I think, some military general down there during the Falklands War, and the pri- the prime minister of England at the time was uh, good old uh, Margaret Thatcher. She tried oh. to get, she tried to kill this guy uh, during the Falklands War. 
What happens to Margaret Thatcher, folks, three weeks after our recent pope is, uh, is inaugurated? She's dead. Three weeks after Pope Francis is, 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 comes into his reign, his arch enemy in England dies. Don't you think that's – I think that's more than a coincidence. What do you think about that? Well, it's no coincidence because we have to remember that the Jesuits run British intelligence. Yeah. And it's the intelligence communities that run the governments of all the worlds of the government that they're over. The intelligence community runs it. They're all dovetailed together at the top at the Vatican as they're overseen by the Knights of Malta and the High Jesuits. Yeah. Um, and another and I want to add this. I want to add this before I forget this one too. Is that because you're a son of, of the Southern Patriots, the Southern White Protestant Patriots, I would suggest as a remedy for your listeners who are also Southern white men, is that you start your own Sons of the Confederate South against Rome. Okay. <laughs> yep. That's a good I'll be idea. happy to speak for you anytime you want me. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. Um, and, and here's just one. We, we want to make sure – I want to make sure I don't leave any of you guys anywhere to run, <laughs> okay? I want to give you no caves to hide in. I want to give you no shade whatsoever. You, you, you're going to have to face the, the glaring sun of truth here. So we need we need to deal with Freemasonry as well because Freemasonry is uh, another – Another kind of issue where they think the Jews run the Freemasonry as well. Okay, we need to get in behind the history of Freemasonry. And isn't the uh, the, the the Golden Revolution of 1688 kind of behind this, uh, Eric? Um, not that I know of. It may have participated, no, I mean, but I mean, we have to remember. I mean, I mean the, the Jesuits get kicked out of England. With the yeah. war, uh, uh, with, when William, William of Orange comes into England, they tried yeah. to regain power in England even after they lost uh, to William of Orange. And so, yeah. in order to in order to regain power uh, in England, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the, you have the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Not one drop of blood was shed. You have James II being driven out. Thank God. My only regret is that. That his daughter, who was married to to uh, uh, William, didn't have him executed. She, he actually let her he let him escape to France. But nonetheless, you have William of Orange in 1689 coming down. He takes the throne, and on the ships that come down, it's on the flags of the ships, the Protestant Reformation and the liberties of the English people. That's all written on the wonder on the flags on the sails of those ships. So he comes in. He's crowned king. And, and in 1690, the Jesuits try to attack again. One year later, it's called the Battle of the Boyne. James II is driven out. He never comes back. He goes to France. And the Jesuits then decide to contrive to take back the throne because the Stuarts now are going to be barred from the throne because of their Catholic design of overthrowing the Protestant liberties there. And I think yeah. in 1701, they're forever banned. And so the Jesuits uh, in, in the early 1700s, by 17, 1724, 25, they write every degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry from, from 1 to 25 in the College of Clermont in Paris, France, where they train their Jesuit Jacob and Robespierre. Yeah. So, so they're busy writing Scottish Rite. So the Jesuits now are going to call upon what's left of the Scottish Templars that are living in Scotland and have Roseland Castle to join with them. So they're going to join up with them. And then when the Jesuits are suppressed by the Pope in 1773, Frederick the Great protects them in Prussia, and they go to Silesia, which will be the heart of the concentration camp system in Poland later, Auschwitz and Silesia. And no. uh, the, while, they're, while the Jesuits are there under Frederick the Great, they're going to write the last eight degrees of Scottish Rite uh, there in, uh, in, uh, in Prussia. So the yeah. Jesuits wrote every rite of the order, of the, of the craft, and you can see this in the rite of Hiram Abiff. You can see it in their use of the term IHS. I have uh, David Bernard's great work, uh, Light on Masonry. He shows you that they're using IHS in their rights with a strictly Jesuit. Mm -hmm. And you got to understand, folks, it, it's right when they are suppressed, that's, that, that's when the big esoteric group starts to get, uh, starts to be, be created, the Illuminati. 
And who do we have as the creator of the Illuminati? A, not, not a Jew, a professional, professional Roman Catholic named Adam Weishaupt. He wasn't just right. a he wasn't just a Catholic layman or something who just likes some flaw. He was a professional. He was a professor of canon law. Okay, and he was right. he was Jesuit trained. That's right. And he, mo- so, he models the Illuminati after the Jesuit order. There's four yes. degrees. There's four degrees of the Illuminates. There's four degrees in the Jesuits generally. Yeah. And when they take their fourth vow, they, which opens the fourth vow, that's that's the bloody oath. The Jesuits. Yeah. So, the, folks, the, the Masonic Lodge. I, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the Templar Rite. I'm, I did a I did a huge presentation when I was in college on Freemasonry. It was such a blast. It wasn't even like doing homework. And uh, I, I I I did my section on the Templar Rite and the Scottish Freemasonry. I can't remember. Do they have an order? The, is there a Knights of Malta order within Freemasonry as well? Is there like a degree? <laughs> That's one yes, of their rights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we have yeah. within the Masonic Lodge. And it, it, it's Templarism. Freemasonry is just Templarism, folks. It's just a revival. Albert, 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 but, yeah. Albert Pike says that very thing in his Morals and Dogma. Yeah. It's Templarism. Yep. Okay. So, so let let's just summarize here, folks, because we're coming to the end of our of our discussion. All right. Th- th- these are all the major points of uh, of contention. Okay. Who were the first international bankers? Were they Jews or were they white Catholics? White Catholics. Who were the first uh, the originators of Zionism? This huge movement towards a regaining of re- it was really the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. That was what it was called. Was it Jews behind that, or was it white Catholics? White Catholics. Who is behind all of the the Jewish Jewish fury literature that you have being uh, being fomented, being being popularized in Nazi Germany? The Roman Catholic theologians, Justin Martyr, John Chrysostom. Uh, who do we have behind the, the Protestant Reformation? It's not Jews. Jews did had nothing whatsoever to do with the, with the, with the uh, furthering of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, who do we have? Who and, do we have? By the, by the way, these, 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 same, these same people, Drake, tell you that Knox was a Jew. That's another John ridiculous. Knox. Yes, they'll tell you Knox was a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And one of the reasons I think it was in the uh, bull, the uh, Dominus Acredemptor Noster, was one of the reasons the, the Jesuits were suppressed was because they had mastered the art of class warfare. They had, right. they had, yes. So <laughs> they were causing the, they were causing class warfare between the orders and the Catholic Church. Yes. Yeah. That's so why, that's why the, the Dominicans. That's why the Dominicans Inquisition. They took the Inquisition from the Jesuits with suppressed, and the Jesuit vengeance on the Dominicans was several thousands of them in France cutting off their disciples and letting them die in the streets. That's what the oh. Jacobins did. The de- wow. Yeah, I remember yep. watching a, a recent movie on Robespierre, and they, they never say it, but they all they, they, they make mention of this, of, of going back to the monastery to talk to the to these guys at the monastery. They never say their names in the movie. It's this recent French movie on Robespierre. It was pretty fascinating. They never actually mention the guy. It's probably Abbe Says they're talking about. But. All right, so sure. who, are the, who are the masters of class warfare? The Jews or the Jesuits? The Jesuits. Okay, who are the men? Who, who, what was the driving influence behind the uh, Civil War? Was it Jews? No, it was the Roman Catholic Holy Roman Empire representative, his name was Prince von Metternich. There's three major documents or three major events you want to look at. You want to look at the Treaty, the, the, the treaty of Verona, the Council of Vienna, and um, the uh, Cherry Council. Okay? And Just Charles Sumner. Council of Vienna is uh, 1814, 1815. Then you have the Secret Treaty of Verona, 1822. Then you have the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, and then you have the secret treaty, the overhearing of what the Jesuit general was talking with other assistants. You have that in 1825. Yeah. Okay. So that is what is behind our invasion down here, my southern brethren. Okay. And who who was behind who was behind the uncivil rights legislation? One of the main players on uh, he he was one of the main guys on the committee was a man named Theodore Hesborough. Okay. You need right. to look into him. The other guy who who is behind the theology and the thinking of Martin Luther King, a Jesuit named John Lafarge Jr., who created communism, 
the Jesuits, not the Jews, who created racial liberation theology, the Jesuits. Uh, who Ignatius Loyola was not a Jew. Ignatius Loyola was a Spanish Roman Catholic. He was not a Jew. He was a uh, so. And who is behind Freemasonry? Very clearly, it's the Templarism of the Roman Catholic Church and the revived Templars, the Jesuit Order. Okay, we, we've left you nowhere to run, my friend. We left you nowhere to sure. go. So, you know, I, I thank you, Eric. If you have, do you have anything else you want to say on the uh, broadcast here? No, I would just uh, encourage the white Southern men that are listening to truly repent of their sins and believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and buried and rose again. And as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So once you're saved, now you have the Spirit of God to begin to resist the power of the devil as exercised through his Jesuits and all their white coadjutors and the, and the, and the, and the uh, white power structure that runs everything. Well, I have, I have two last things I wanted to ask you. Um, you you have I think in your broadcast you've mentioned a book that was being it's being written or will be written or published soon. It's uh, by a black lady who wrote a book on Martin exposing Martin Luther King. Can you give me the title of that book? Oh yes, I have it for sale. Uh, okay. Her name is the author is Erin Fraser. Okay. And the book is titled King: Colon Was He a False Prophet? Okay. And she completely Excellent. takes him apart. She, she she mentions Lafarge. She mentions the whole civil rights movement being run by the Jesuits. She shows how it's anti-black. It was never intended to benefit the black people. And she has a picture of him uh, with uh, Paul VI, with Ralph Abernathy, and Marchinkus. <laughs> They're in the same picture when they went to the Vatican. So I remember Martin King, Michael King, that was his real name. He never changed his name to Martin Luther King. It was Michael King. Uh, he yeah. was a member of the Bully Society. And the Bully Society, for your listeners, is nothing more than a black skull and bones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the, his, the university that he went to. Was, uh, over, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of administrated by a Freemason, was it not? I think so. You know, he went to Boston University, too. Oh, oh and, and Boston, yeah. Boston University is very much linked to Boston College. Okay. Yeah. So you know there was an absolute Jesuit connection between between um, King and the Civil Rights Movement. Of course, then, again, look, you got the Civil Rights Who's reporting this? Do you think I could get the press out uh, report doing anything on me? Why, of course not. <laughs> yeah. Henry, yeah. Henry Luce, Henry Robinson Luce, the Knight of Malta, in control of Time Life, and you had Frank Shakespeare, who was the head of CBS, both of them Knights of Malta. They gave him all kinds of press when this march to Washington, what, in 1962, early 63? He had the Post okay. press behind it. Um, the other question that I had, and I, I, it takes me so long to like read through your book because <laughs> – I, I want to I want to spend so much time and 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 g gather everything. Every chapter I read in your book is like it's mind blowing. I have to like I can't I can't just leave the chapter without digging everything out of it. So I haven't I haven't really I haven't really gotten um, to this point yet. And I wanted to see if you could maybe throw a couple things here at, at me. Um, you 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 are and I I can see it happening in in global affairs. But I, I would really like to have a quote for some friends of mine uh, on the issue of the, the, the Sino-Soviet Muslim invasion uh, and the Russian invasion that we have here. Is there any like books that actually document where somebody states that there there is an intention for this to happen? Uh, or is this a, a deduction that you have from a number of global events that have happened? Um. I don't have – the only statement that I have is from the Chinese with their intention to invade. Because okay. when they were practicing in the Straits of Formosa, um, someone had kind of cost them. It was reported, I think, in the British press. And they said, what are you doing this for? And some of the men they interviewed said they were preparing for the invasion of America. What was That's it what called? What was, what, what was, it was a parade? No, no. It was a – it was a um, – uh, military operation, the naval operation in the Straits of Formosa. Straits of Formosa. South China Sea, something around there. Okay. And they were practicing for their, their naval uh, practice for invasion. 
Okay. Someone was uh, questioned by them, and they said, well, this is, we're preparing for the invasion of North America. I mean, in China right now, they teach Australia as new China. They're going to invade Australia, too. Yeah. They're going to take New Zealand, Australia. They're going to take the whole Pacific Rim, and when they're done doing that, then they'll come over to the West Coast here, as the Japanese intended to do, but never were, never carried it out because the Jesuits didn't want them to succeed. But succeed, but the Jesuits want the Chinese to succeed, so they will successfully land on the West Coast. I thought I, I listened to and an other, interview. Go ahead, one, sorry. One more thing. There's never been a division between communist China and communist Russia. Never. They've always worked together. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, they, I, I don't know of any fights they've had anytime soon. Um, never. Yeah. I know another interview that you have done, I, I thought I remember you um, quoting a book on this about – uh, Cuba being used as a platform or a kind of a gateway into North America. Um, did I hear that right? Yeah, um, you, you, that's correct. I mentioned that Cuba is to be a staging base because that was the that was one of the designs of Operation Northwoods. Oh yeah, that's right. To, yeah. send, to send an aircraft over there to pretend uh, it got shot down by Cuba and then to uh, supposedly foam out a war. That was just that was just poppycock. It was the purpose of closing off Cuba yeah. so that it could then be isolated from Americans so that it could be prepared for a, a, a staging base into North America. And that's why they have a, a large, some large ports there because they're going to need these ports when, they, when the attack comes from Senegal and Mar- Mediterranean. And by the way, the ports in those African countries are owned and controlled by the Chinese Hmm. Just like okay. Panama Canal is controlled by the Chinese, so oh, when they right. come in, a huge sweeping attack from from off from Africa and then up through the Panama Canal, Cuba will be a staging base. They got all kinds of weapons there to load up, and I maintain they have an underground corridor from Cuba to Miami, and they'll be showing up just immediately, uh, coming up there through some underground tunnels that they've built. And it'll be a huge surprise invasion because the press will not be reported here, just like they were, were involved in the uh, uh, invasion of uh, Hawaii with the Pearl Harbor. The press was involved in that, keeping that a surprise. Yep, yep. Wow, wow, that's freaky, man. And I, I remember when I when I watched the movie, um, the Battle of Los Angeles, just a couple months yep. ago, when I watched that, man, that was freaky. That was freaky. <laughs> <laughs> It just was just so realistic. Yeah. Have you heard about that new robot that they've released recently, the Atlas robot? Yeah, yeah. Just this Starba. month. I think Starba, Starba, Starba makes it, yeah. Yeah, up in Boston Dynamics. It is a is a fully functional free Terminator. I, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was looking at it. Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Right. Uh, the Terminator is a real deal. Not all yep. the super things that was in Schwarzenegger's movie, but they have the real deal going. And what better thing to do to send Terminators in to kill people, and then you don't have to risk your soldiers? Exactly, exactly. They have no will. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure, Eric. Thank you so much for coming on. We're gonna have to have you again. Okay. My pleasure, Drake, and Lord bless, and Lord bless your listeners too. All right. Thanks. Have a good one. God bless. Bye.